um, uh, Dr. Winkenwarder, as uh, really doesn't need any introduction, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs here has um, uh, uh, graciously offered some of his time to come down and talk to you about some of the specific medical aspects related to uh, the relief operation that's underway and some of the considerations that are going on within not only the Defense Department but across the government uh, as we look at uh, potential challenges in the days ahead with respect to those affected areas. So, uh, um, like I said, I know you're all tired and it's getting towards the end of the day, so let's get right into it here. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon. I'm here also with uh, Lieutenant General Peach Taylor, Surgeon General of the United States Air Force, and with uh, uh, Admiral Kathy Martin, who is the uh, Deputy Surgeon General of the United States Navy. We're here today to speak about the U.S. Uh, medical and public health response to the tsunami disaster. Uh, as you know already by now, the U.S. military, and particularly the United States Navy, but increasingly over the, over the days and weeks ahead, the United States Marines are already delivering much needed aid, food and water, and other materials, and all of these will contribute in a major way to preventing a second wave of disaster and grief uh, in the way of medical and public health problems and diseases. However, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of displaced individuals in the affected countries at this time. Uh, these people are obviously not in their homes. They, in many cases, are in crowded conditions, possibly, and in, in fact, likely not living in very hygienic conditions. All of this creates a, a breeding ground for um, disease and for epidemics, and we're concerned about the possibility of that. Uh, let me just take a moment or two to talk about some of the diseases and public health problems that we are anticipating could happen and that we are preparing for. Certainly top among those are waterborne diarrheal illnesses, uh, things like uh, and I'll use a medical term here, E. coli. It's the same kind of thing that you would get from travelers' uh, diarrhea, uh, but certainly that's part of the uh, uh, normal body uh, materials that once it gets out into the water can, can be infectious and uh, affect uh, people very easily. Also cholera, a very serious uh, disease, hepatitis A uh, is another uh, waterborne infectious disease. And then, of course, there are respiratory diseases, uh, the, the typical uh, viruses and bacteria that affect people in general. Uh, certainly measles is another possibility uh, as a disease. And then uh, also in the coming weeks, uh, we will have to be looking out for things like dengue uh, and malaria. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, there are also the problems of injuries that can occur with so much loose material uh, around and efforts to uh, re reconstruct or clear uh, lots of heavy materials, people get hurt. What have we done so far? Uh, we have assessment teams, uh, the DOD and the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, USAID, uh, have assessment teams in all three countries looking at this issue or these issues. Uh, as you well know, we've also transported some sick and injured um, in helicopters to local host nation medical facilities. Uh, the Navy has deployed a preventive medicine team that is, tip, that is normally based in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia, and certainly the fact that they were right there close at hand made it quite easy for them to go out into the field to begin to look at uh, the possibility of these problems. Back here in Washington, uh, we have been working with the Pacific Command. Uh, we've been working with USAID. We've been working with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers to, for Disease Control to develop a coordinated joint strategy way ahead about the best way to support these nations and also to support the non-governmental organizations, the relief organizations, as they do their work. We are prepared. 
to provide a significantly enhanced effort, a major effort if needed. Uh, what we've already learned, uh, and this just comes in today uh, from Secretary Powell, is that there is a need for more forensics support. We are now identifying from DOD a mortuary affairs uh, team or teams and personnel and forensic personnel. Uh, we're also um, in contact with the Department of, of Homeland Security, uh, who within their purview uh, it, within FEMA uh, has similar types of capabilities. Let me describe briefly for you our concept of the way that we think that we can be most helpful, really two areas. Uh, and the first of that is to, where it is needed, create platforms create facilities that can be used by host nation medical providers and also by the non-governmental uh, organization medical providers. To the extent that medical infrastructure is destroyed in certain places, we can put and are prepared to put field hospitals all, ranging all the way from small packages that the Air Force can provide, and I'll let General Taylor describe that in a minute, to larger hospitals that could be 100 or 200 uh, beds. The second way in which we think that we can be most helpful is to assist with the whole matter of logistics. I think you've already been reading and hearing about <clears throat> the fact that getting the right aid to the right place, at, to the right person at the right time is, uh, is really the key task at hand. And certainly this applies in the area of medicines, uh, vaccines, uh, other medical materials. And so we want to and are prepared to assist with that effort. Uh, I want to emphasize that we seek an opportunity to partner with uh, host nations, with the World Health Organization, and with non-governmental organizations to get the job done. I have already been in contact with the, uh, with the UN, with the World Health Organization, we've established a memorandum of agreement uh, about the way in which we want to work together. And uh, in addition to that, I'll say that uh, uh, they are taking a step to locate their medical response focus at Utapau, Thailand, which is where uh, our central coordination area, so we'll be working right alongside them. Uh, I've also been in contact with Secretary Thompson uh, at Health and Human Services and CDC Director Julie Gerbening, uh, and we're working closely together, and uh, we are very well prepared to respond. So with that, let me uh, take any questions you may have. Have you seen any outbreak of disease at all so far? We've not yet received any, uh, out, uh, any report of an outbreak of either a widespread disease or isolated diseases at this point. Yes. How many um, field hospitals and how many larger facilities are you capable of setting up maximum? And um, what kind of uh, stockpiles do you have of the medicines and vaccines that you'll need? We would be prepared to provide several. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, four, five, six, eight field hospitals if needed. We have that type of capability that can be flown in or shipped in relatively quickly. Uh, in the way of materials, uh, I can't give you a specific number or amount of, of, uh, uh, of drugs or other medical materials, but we certainly have plenty of medical materials uh, on hand within the, the Pacific Command Theater that could be used to, uh, to, to assist with the efforts. Yes. How quickly can you uh, deploy those field hospitals? And in hindsight, should those field hospitals and the uh, Navy uh, Mercy ship been uh, deployed earlier? Uh, with respect to your first question of how quickly we can deploy those, let me let me ask uh, General Taylor to come up just to talk about the, the 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 smallest and most nimble of those capabilities, the Air Force package. My middle name is Peach, and that's what I usually go by. George. 
Peach Taylor Jr. Peach, Peach like a peach, yeah. It's a family Peach. name. Yeah. No, your daddy gives it to you. You might as well use it. <laughs> I'm a junior, so he has the same problem as I do. Um, the Air Force over the last 10 years have, has, because of the way we lay down small numbers of people in remote locations, we've developed very small uh, hospitals, gone from a fairly large structure, uh, hospital structure, to a smaller hospital structure. So we have uh, hospitals ranging from, can fit on a one C-130, mm -hmm to our 25-bed hospitals usually take about two C-17s. You'll have seen C-17s. And so we actually have one of those 25-bed hospitals at Yakota now uh, that could deploy as is called for, as, as is called for. We need to know where to go. We need to be able to get in into whatever location we're going, and we need to be able to handle it, hand it off to a competent authority. It comes with people or without people. Both are capable. So it's a pretty much a modular build from a 130 worth of equipment or a single pallet position up to this uh, fairly large version, which is a 25 bed uh, hospital. And how long does it take to deploy the small well, They're one sitting on the ramp at Yokota today at uh, Tokyo. Yeah, the, the, if you put together, for us, if you put together two of these, you get 50. If you put together three, you get, and they're, they're modular beyond that. The Army and the Navy have much larger footprint. The value of the Air Force footprint is two C-17s arrive and land with a hospital and ambulances. How many do you yeah. have? Uh, the problem is we're in the middle of reconstructing. We've deployed a lot of these out to the, uh, to, the for, to the war, and we've been in the process of reconstructing them all. And we can get you the information that we can let out to you is exactly what we have of each of these types, what the types look like, and what capacity we have in the system today. And what then it depends the on where they're located. What about the personnel, the staff? You said you don't have the personnel. You've got yep. the equipment. Oh, oh, we have personnel to do that, yeah. So you can send, you, if you want to just hand the equipment off, bring your people, hand it off to the local authorities. Here's how, the, here's how you set it up, and here's how the equipment works. We're out. Full package. Right, but we can put the people in as well. It's about 85 or 90 people to go let, in. Let me, let me just say, again, one of the reasons we think it's so important to work closely with the host nation is when you, you get into the, at times, rather complicated process of interacting with a patient, it's, it, the language is a very important issue. So being able to utilize uh, the medical providers who, who are from those regions and who live and work there as much to everyone's advantage. So we want to take advantage of that, working together with them. Uh, you, you are you're offering these medical facilities, but no one is uh, uh, no one has actually asked for them yet. Is that where we stand on this? Uh, I don't think that's quite uh, correct in the sense that that uh, you know. we have the assessment teams who are out in conversation with various authorities out in the region. They're developing those assessments, and we hope to have them very, very soon. Do you know where they're going to go? Can you tell us where they're going to go? I can't uh, give you uh, a specific answer on that just yet. Okay, can I also just follow up? You mentioned uh, the need for more forensics, uh, and you were looking at DOD personnel. Do you have any idea how many may be uh, deployed over there? Um, it would probably be in the range of 100 to 150 people. Is that in addition to the two teams that have already gone from Hawaii? Yes. 100 more? Yes. Sir, following up on that, and is it safe to assume from what you're saying here, it sounds like you're saying the one thing that everybody is, is asking for right now is mortuary affairs people. That's that, the that's, grim. That's correct. And, and part of one of the questions you were asked was about the mercy. We were told earlier that yes. there was serious consideration being given to putting it into operation. Can you sort there of us up to date on that? There's consideration of that. Um, I've had discussion with Admiral Fargo uh, that is being evaluated. And um, we don't have any decision to announce right now on that, uh, but we're looking at that. And if we do deploy that asset, it's a major, a major capability, but we want to do it in a way that we, again, work together with the host nations and with non-governmental organizations. We want to do it in an innovative way. Is there a legal question there on the NGO connection with them? Uh well, we, we've asked that, and a good question, and the answer is we believe we can do this. Uh, our legal affairs uh, team has looked at this and does not see any um, legal reason for why we cannot invite them into our facilities or into our ships if need be. Asked, I understand they've asked to, uh, to be accommodated on that, is that right? Who, uh, NGOs, at least one. Um, yes, yes, that's correct.
What would be the ship's travel time to the region? The the the, the large ship, the Mercy, would take two to three, two and a half to three weeks. I mean, transit time. Has there been consideration to getting it underway and then making decisions as it's en route? Well, as you as you may already know from the discussions with Admiral Fargo, it is has been out uh, sort of doing checks to make sure it's sea ready, and uh, and then uh, so it is awaiting uh, deployment if if so ordered. Sir, could you give us just a little more detail on what sort of skills and resources U.S. military mortuary affairs people can bring to the table, and what sort of experience does the U.S. military have with dealing with this kind of a mass casualty uh, event like this? Well, certainly this is a, a mass casualty event of the, of the greatest proportion possible. And, uh, and uh, so, but any, any set of deaths, uh, is is um, and put the put it this way, our mortuary affairs people are prepared to assist and to help, and uh, we believe that they'll do a fine job. Uh, I, I don't know that there's anything specific relative to the scope and size of the event that that one uh, that requires a specific set of skills. I mean, it's dealing with people who've died, bodies who have died, and how to dispose of them, and how to take care of all those uh, issues. Let me mention one other thing, because I know there's, there's been a couple of news reports, and I would like to uh, at least offer some caution, and that is the, the health risk posed by a dead or decomposing body in the water. And I know there have been a couple of reports that this is a, uh, is a setup for uh, a large disease. We've had our um, people look at that and they b don't believe that that is a major health risk situation, that alone. Certainly uh, it, it's possible that disease uh, could emerge from a, from a, uh, a dead body, but uh, that is, it's, it's not a major concern for us. Far more likely is disease that could be passed among the living in the, in the way of infectious disease from one person to another. Yes. Um, could you remind, remind me again how many uh, military doctors there are in the region now and how many more uh, you are considering <clears throat> putting in the region? We, I don't have a, a number for you. We can get that for you on the number in the region. Um, and we don't have a, a specific um, number on who might be deployed. Uh, because we're awaiting those uh, final assessments. Message is that we're prepared and, and we're ready. We've looked at the situation. The assessments are coming in and we want to work with, plan to work with very closely uh, non-governmental organizations with host nations and with others and work in a very cooperative way and, and do the things that we're most effective at doing. Do you anticipate calling anyone out of the reserve units or uh, to get medical personnel? No, to go I don't anticipate that now. Yes. On the um, portable hospitals, am I correct in assuming that the infrastructure in Iraq is now sufficiently built that they're not going to be called into uh, into that theater in the event of a, another increase in the insurgency? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, the, uh, the, is there any danger that the hospital sets that are being refitted right now and might be sent? over to Asia could be pressed into service for Iraq. Whoa. There, or, or the there hospital problem set with up competing in Iraq? requirements and yeah. the answer would be no. Because your Iraq infrastructure is strong enough. We're, we're sufficiently supplied and, and capable and have all the equipment we need to conduct all the medical operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Let's uh, take one more here. Yeah. Has there, you know, since the September 11th attacks of 2001, there's been a lot of speculation or concern about a, a, a possible human attack of this that could end up with casualties of this scale. Have you developed any response capabilities since then that are going to be able to come into play with this? Are you are you speaking about a domestic uh, disaster? Well, I mean, well, 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 yeah, domestic. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, what's it was focused for domestic, but this is clearly an international disaster. Right. Well, we continually plan and work together with the uh, civilian authorities, principally the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, I would just take the opportunity to say that 
quite a lot of exchange has gone on, mutual learning, mutual work, establishing communication relationships and plans for how to deal with a mass casualty event in the United States. Uh, there is a national response plan that uh, comes out of the whole federal government. There's a medical annex or piece to that. We've been quite involved in working with these other authorities to develop that. And so uh, from my perspective, we are better prepared for such an event than we've ever been. Um, and so uh, we certainly obviously don't um, uh, hope that hope that there's never such an event. But I think this uh, event and the great unfortunate that's happened in Southeast Asia uh, ought to give all, all Americans a, um, a sense for just how significant a major disaster could be. And uh, our hearts and thoughts go out to the people of that whole region. We're here to help. We want to help. We're prepared to help. Thank you. Thank you. Just by way of it is so late in the afternoon, and we are starting early in the morning, I, I want to let you know that we, our first briefing tomorrow morning will be at 8 o'clock in the morning. It will be Major General uh, Shirelli, the first CAV uh, Division Commander from Baghdad, and it will be two way, uh, so you'll be able to ask questions too. So. Do you know if it will include Baghdad Press Corps? Or? It will. Okay. So is, is it is, it is scheduled to.